nature of managerial economics, the managerial decision-making process. Alam nyo ba, managerial economics is worth studying because it offers answers to a variety of fundamental questions. For example, how do managers make good operating and planning decisions? What peoples must be avoided? When are the markets too attractive that entry becomes appealing? How to effectively motivate employees to produce more? These questions involve meaningful economic issues that pose a continuing challenge to managers. Successful managers make good decisions and one of the most useful tools employed by these successful managers is the methodology of managerial economics. So what then is managerial economics? Managerial economics is the analysis of major management decisions using the tools of economics because it uses the tools and techniques of economic analysis to solve managerial problems. Managerial economics connects traditional economics with decision sciences to develop vital tools for managerial decision making. Managerial economics applies many familiar concepts from economics to aid managers in making better decisions. Kaya nga, you have to become familiar with the concepts related to microeconomics as well as macroeconomics. Steps to better decision making. Making sound managerial decisions involve seven steps. One, define the problem. What is the problem the manager faces? Identifying the decision context or setting and the decision maker represents a large step toward understanding the choice process. So that's the first step. It's important for us to establish first what the problem is all about. Number two step, determine the objective. What is the decision maker's goal? Earning a profit is the primary objective of the firm and profit is easily defined as total revenue minus total cost. Thus, among alternative courses of action, the manager must select the one that will maximize the profit of the firm. So, it is all about profit maximization. Important yan. So, that's the second step. Determine the objective. Number three, explore the alternatives. What are the alternative courses of action? What are the variables under the decision maker's control? What constraints limit the choice of options? The decision maker must explore all available courses of action and then choose the one that would best achieve his or her objective. So, so far, we're through with the three steps. Now, let's have number four. Predict the consequences. What are the consequences of each alternative actions? Should conditions change, how would this affect outcomes? Depending on the situation, the task of predicting the consequences may be straightforward. In more complicated situations, however, the decision maker often must rely on a model 
to describe how options translate into outcomes. A model is a simplified description of a process, relationship, or other economic phenomenon. Of course, the main purpose of model building is to explain and to predict, to account for past outcomes, and to forecast. Keep in mind that the best model is the one that best describes reality and is the simplest. Now, let's have step number five. Make a choice. What is the preferred course of action? Once the decision maker has put the problem in context, formalized the objectives, and identified available alternatives, how does the manager go about finding a preferred course of action? Number six, perform sensitivity analysis. How does the optimal decision change if conditions in the problem are altered? In tackling and solving a decision problem, it is important to understand and be able to explain the why of your decision. So it's important to conduct sensitivity analysis. Number seven, conduct the evaluation. Are the decisions made effective? Gather and analyze evidence to determine whether decisions made were effective in accomplishing the firm's objective. So these are the steps for us to arrive at better decision making. To emphasize, let me repeat it for you. Seven proven steps for sound decisions. Number one, define the problem. Number two, determine the objective. Number three, explore the alternatives. Number four, predict the consequences. Five, make a choice. Six, perform sensitivity analysis. And seven, conduct the evaluation. The theory of the firm. Firm exists because they are useful in producing and distributing goods and services. They are economic entities and are best analyzed in the context of an economic model. The basic model of business is known as the theory of the firm. The firm is taught to maximize profit. Today, in a more complete model, the primary goal of the firm is long-run expected value maximization. Let's talk about the value of the firm. The firm's value is defined as the present value of its expected future profits and can be expressed as follows. As in equation 1.1. So here we have pi 1, pi 2, up to pi n. These are the expected profits in each year, T. I is the appropriate interest or discount rate. In summation form, so we can easily express these expected profits to simplify our equation. But, Equation 1.1 can be rewritten as in equation 1.2. That is, if we take note of our definition of profit, that is the difference between total revenue and total cost. Thus, in making any decisions, the manager must attempt to predict its impact on future profit flows and determine whether indeed it will add to the value of the firm. 
constraints and the theory of the firm. Managerial decisions are often made in light of constraints imposed by technology, resource scarcity, contractual obligations, and government laws and regulations. To make decisions that will maximize value, managers must consider both short-run and long-run implications as well as how various external constraints affect their ability to achieve organizational objectives. Firms frequently face limited essential inputs, such as skilled labor, raw materials, specialized machinery, and warehouse space. Managers also often face capital constraints that place limitations on the amount of investment funds available for a particular project. Managerial decisions can also be constrained by contractual requirements. For example, labor contracts limit flexibility in worker scheduling and job assignment, affecting whether labor costs are fixed or variable. In other instances, output must meet certain minimum quality requirements. Legal restrictions, which affect both production and marketing activities, can also play an important role in managerial decisions. Laws that define minimum wages, health and safety standards, pollution emission standards, fuel efficiency requirements, and fair pricing and marketing practices all limit managerial flexibility. Value maximization is not the only model of managerial behavior. In fact, may mga alternative models to the theory of the firm. So here, we will mention only two. Firstly, satisfying model. Do managers really try to optimize? Ibig sabihin, seek the best result or merely satisfies. Ibig sabihin, seek satisfactory rather than optimize results. The model of satisfying behavior posits that the typical firm strives for a satisfactory level of performance rather than attempting to maximize its objective. Thus, a firm might aspire to a level of annual profit, say 80 million pesos, and be satisfied with policies that achieve this benchmark. This behavior is particularly prevalent if identifying and analyzing other potentially more profitable courses of action is complicated and costly. Second, maximizing sales model. Total assets are a visible benchmark of managerial success. Studies show a close association between executive compensation and company sales. The above alternative models of managerial behavior has added to our understanding of how firms behave. Talking about economic costs, basically, economists deal with something they call opportunity costs or alternative costs. Opportunity cost is the amount or subjective value for gun in choosing one activity over the next best alternative. This cost must be considered whenever decisions are made under conditions of scarcity. This means that the cost of a resource is what a business must pay for it to attract it into its employee or, put differently, 
what a business must pay to keep this resource from finding employment elsewhere. To get down to specific examples, we can mention the following. 1. Replacement cost versus historical cost. To an economist, the replacement cost of a piece of machinery and therefore the level of periodic depreciation on the replacement cost is important. Whereas, an accountant measures cost and depreciation on a historical basis. Number two, implicit cost and normal profits. The owner's time and interest on the capital they contributed are usually counted as profit in a partnership or a single proprietorship. However, the owners could work for someone else instead and invest their funds elsewhere. So these two items are really cost to the business and not profit. The preceding item is not relevant in the case of a corporation. The preceding item is not relevant in the case of a corporation because even top executives are salaried employees and interest on corporate debt is deducted as an expense before profits are calculated. However, the payments made to the owners or stockholders, dividends, are not part of costs. They are recorded as distribution of profits. But surely, part of the shareholders' return is similar to the interest on debt because stockholders could have invested their funds elsewhere and required a certain return in order to leave the investment with the corporation. Thus, on this account, corporate profits as recorded by accountants tend to be overstated. It appears, therefore, that an economist includes costs that would be excluded by an accountant. Indeed, the economist refers to the second category of costs which are essential to obtain and keep the owner's resources in the business as normal profits, which represents the return that these resources de demand to remain committed to a particular firm. Thus, economic costs include not only the historical costs and explicit costs recorded by the accountants, but also the replacement costs and implicit costs, normal profits, that must be earned on the owner's resources. Profits are considered to be economic profits, which are defined as total revenue minus all the economic costs. Role of business in society in the 21st century. We can deny that companies have a clear responsibility to earn profits for their shareholders or that most shareholders invest primarily to make money. But they also have a responsibility to the societies that grant them the right to operate. And they can fulfill both responsibilities profitably Social and environmental responsibility can be a source of long-term competitive advantage. So, what role should businesses can play in society? We will highlight five rules of business. One, businesses should make as much money as possible while confirming to the basic rules of the society. Both those embodied in law and those embodied in ethical customs. 
Number two, maximizing shareholder value over a particular time period may satisfy the interest of shareholders. The challenge is figuring out how to allocate human and financial capital to its best and highest use for the long term. Value creation by means of maximizing long-term free cash flow. To maximize long-term free cash flow, a company must properly manage its relationship with all of its shareholders. Number three, a growing number of investors are looking for responsible investment opportunities that promise a mix of both financial and social returns. Number four, businesses benefit from social stability and good prosperity. They need educated, hardworking, ethical employees and reliable, efficient suppliers. And they need public infrastructure, not only physical infrastructure, like highways and airports, but also social infrastructure like good schools, safe neighborhoods, and effective legal system. Number five, the last one, capitalizing in community and workplace health programs makes good business sense, providing returns on investment through cost savings and increase productivity because it's important for businesses to take note of these uh, very vital rules for them to become or stay competitive in the 21st century. Sigurado, if businesses that ignore the broader social and environmental context in which they operate are likely to pay a price. For example, reputational damage and loss of brand value, failing sales, difficulties in recruiting talent, lower worker productivity, corruption, tougher government regulation, or an increase in climate change-related costs. Kaya it's important for businesses to seriously observe these rules. But businesses cannot solve such problems by themselves. Solutions depend on innovative collaboration among private companies, non-profit organizations, and most important, with the government. I think that concludes our discussion about the nature of managerial economics. To summarize, so let me just uh, give you a few important uh, uh, points about what we have discussed so far. So, lima lang ito, lima lang. Una, Managerial economics is the analysis of major managerial decisions using the tools of economics. Managerial economics applies many familiar concepts from economics to aid managers in making better decisions. Pangalawa, pangalawang point from our discussion. Uh, the firm is told to maximize profits. Yes, maximize profit. You heard it right. The primary goal of the firm is long-run expected value maximization according to the theory of the firm. Number three, managerial decisions are often made in light of constraints. Managers must consider both short-run and long-run implications as well as how various external constraints affect their ability to achieve organizational objectives. Number four, economists deal with something they call opportunity costs. 
Itong concept ng opportunity cost, napaka-importante neto pagdating sa decision making. Why? Because you really have to make a decision kung ano talaga yung option na pwede mong i-sacrifice. Okay? So, that's the essence of opportunity cost. And number five, companies have a responsibility to their shareholders. But, they also have responsibilities to the societies that grant them the right to operate. Okay? So, I think that summarizes everything that we have discussed in this lecture about the nature of managerial economics.